I search the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along And put me back together
There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I will bow to the things of this world and I
Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Hi church, I'm Michaela, and today I only have one thing to share with you. Next Sunday during our online gathering, we will be celebrating communion together. So prepare something from the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Jesus as atonement for our sins, and prepare some form of bread that represents Christ's body broken for us. Pastor Dale will lead us as we remember what Christ did on the cross for us. And if you will be joining us at the outdoor watch party next Sunday, we will have communion elements available for those who want them. And now it's time to turn our attention to God's word. So grab your Bible and let's join Pastor Dale for the message. Good morning, Calvary Fellowship. Great to be with you this morning. Today we're in Colossians, continuing on in chapter 1, uh, verse 18 through 20 today, talking about Jesus being the firstborn of the new creation. Anybody getting tired of this world? Things just aren't right in this world. If, as you probably have noticed, it's fallen. Uh, we get so upset, at least I have been, when I watch the news. You see everything going on with the coronavirus and uh, what's supposed to be justice is actually injustice. And it's like we're living in the inverse world of darkness where superheroes are the bad guys. Discouragement easily can set in when we're quarantined and discouraged about what's going on in this world and separated from one another in fellowship. And so this message today speaks to our current situation of craziness. Um, and so this craziness that we're experiencing is nothing new to the creation that we belong to. Creation has been actually groaning since the fall of man. In Romans 8, verse 18, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pain of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so, as we wait in this messed up world, we groan inwardly, longing for that new creation and redemption to be fulfilled. So let this passage today be an encouragement to you in the midst of the craziness, the sickness, and the sin that we see all around us. These things won't endure. They will soon pass away. And so as we are here in Colossians chapter 1, we remember last week that Jesus is creator of a perfect creation. He was firstborn of creation, it says. Um, and that creation is subject now to the fall, to sin and all of its effects. But now we see Christ presented as redeemer of that fallen creation, firstborn of the new creation. And so we have so much to look forward to, although right now it doesn't seem like it many times. In Revelation 21, we see the end of all things and the new creation itself. It says in verse 1 of Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And then in the next chapter, starting in verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. 
also on either side of the river, the tree of life, which it, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp for sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. So as we start this passage, if you are discouraged in this crazy world, remember the new creation that we have in Jesus Christ. So point number one is he is the beginning of a new creation. In verse 18, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Christ is called the head, the head of the body, meaning he's the source as well as the leader. All authority, direction, empowerment for growth comes from him. And so the closer you are to the head, actually, the closer you are to one another in the body of Christ. There's various styles of church leadership out there in churches around the world. Uh, there's the elder-led church or the congregational-led church that's more like a democracy or a bishop-led church, which is more of the CEO style. But no matter what style of leadership a church has, the most biblical kind is the one in which Jesus is the head of the church. If Jesus is the head, um, like if you can imagine Mr. T saying it, I pity the fool that tries to tell the church what to do because they're messing with Christ's body. Now, being connected to the head is very important. I remember when I was a kid and I saw my first chicken decapitated and I was visiting some relatives and was on their property and, and they chopped off the head of a chicken and that thing ran all over the place and all sorts of activity happening until it runs out of energy. Churches that lose connection with the head, Jesus, they run around with all sorts of activity, but eventually they run out of energy. There's no life in that body, even though it looks like it's alive. So stay connected to the head as a church. You know, some years ago, someone on the church staff that I was a part of um, was really good at graphics. And so they took all the staff pictures and placed our heads on the body of various um, different pictures. So our worship leader, um, his head was on the head of a, or the body of a ballerina. Uh, our associate pastor was on a shirtless bodybuilder body. And uh, he put my head on the disco style piano player um, with a mullet and all that stuff. It was really funny. But the photos, though hilarious, are a good example of what it looks like when the church doesn't put Jesus Christ as the head. And so the question is, when the world looks at the church, does it see Christ as the head? Or would it laugh at some misfit church body with the head being somebody else other than Jesus Christ? So it's so important to keep Jesus as the head of the church. G. Campbell Morgan said this, the church of God, apart from the person of Christ, is a useless structure. However ornate it may be in its organization, however perfect in all its arrangements, however rich and increased with goods, if the church is not revealing the person, that's Jesus, lifting him to the height where all men can see him, then the church becomes an impertinence and a sham a blasphemy and a fraud. And the sooner the world is rid of it, the better. You know, may that not be true of our church. This word for church is interesting. It refers to a body of free citizens that are called together by a herald. So a herald goes through a city and calls out the citizens for a meeting. Here, specifically, when we speak of ecclesia or church, it's an assembly of believers called together in the name of Christ. 
And so that's a great reminder that the church is not a building, but the people. Not an institution, but a living organism. When we talk about the church, there is the universal church, which is basically the body of Christ throughout the whole world. All believers, all the called out ones that are baptized into the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. But also when we talk about church, we talk about the local church being that group of believers that gathers personally, locally under Christ's lead, no matter what form of leadership it may have. Now, Christ is not only the head of the church, but he is also the beginning. As last week, we talked about him being the Alpha and Omega. Just as Genesis begins with, in the beginning, the new creation will begin in the same way. In the beginning, Jesus. Jesus was there discipling the first church. He sent his spirit to empower it and to help it grow. And you become a part of Christ's body the moment you place your faith in Christ and the spirit indwells you. He is the beginning of that new life. He is the firstborn from the dead. He's the one who conquered sin on the cross and he conquered death through his resurrection. He's the firstborn of the resurrected saints. Now, when you look at scripture, there's a number of people that were raised from the dead only to die again at some point, but Jesus was the first one to be raised and never die again. He became the head of the church by being the first to be resurrected with an eternal resurrection body. And that's the body he will have when we see him one day. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it speaks of how important it is that Jesus is the firstborn among the dead, that he was actually resurrected bodily. It says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, that's through Adam, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. That's Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So he is the firstborn among the dead. He is the new creation to come. In Romans 6, when we speak of being identified with Christ through baptism, we're actually talking about being identified through his death and resurrection. It says this, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so notice that the resurrection from the dead is also a picture of how we live today that we die to our old life, and now we no longer live according to sin, but in the newness of life that Jesus Christ brought for us. Jesus is firstborn of the dead. And again, this word firstborn speaks of being in first position um, with the implication of prominence. Um, kind of like the first lady. We talked about that last week. It doesn't mean that the first lady was uh, the first woman in creation, but that she has a position of prominence. And so Christ is the firstborn among the dead, and he's preeminent. This word preeminent literally means to have the first place in everything. So he is the firstborn of creation and the new creation. 
There's no part of eternity past or there's no part of eternity future that he is not preeminent. He must have the first place in everything in creation, and he does, but we in our lives must place him first, that we make him first in the church, the first in the ministry that we do. He must have first place in our relationships, first place in our job, in our finances, in our recreation. Everything that we do, we put Jesus Christ first. And that's really one of the purposes of this section is to show that Christ is supreme. And so ask yourself, do you allow him that place in your life? Does anything supersede his preeminence in your heart? When we discovered that the sun was the center of our solar system, we had to change our whole way of thinking from a geocentric model of the universe to understanding a much bigger picture that we revolved around the sun, not the other way around. And that the sun gives light to the earth and life. Discovering that Christ is the center should also change our whole view on life. Christianity is not something where we compartmentalize our faith as a part of our life, but rather we center our life around Jesus Christ, who brings light and life to every part of our relationship with him. And as it continues in verse 19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The second point that we see is our creator becomes part of his creation. When it speaks of the fullness, this word was actually a technical term for those false teachers called the Gnostics. They loved this term fullness, denoting the totality of the supernatural powers that controlled men's lives. And so they saw these elemental spirits and these emanations that flowed from God that actually were involved in creation because God was too pure to um, create physical matter. It had to be some spirits that were um, separated from God somehow. So to the Gnostic, as the life application commentary says, fullness meant all the angelic powers that emanate from God, fill the space between heaven and earth and act as intermediaries between God and humans. There's a reason why Paul uses this word eight times in this letter. As Kent Hughes says, Paul's use of the word fullness here was an intentional slap at the Gnostics who used the same word, plurema, to denote the totality of all the thousands of divine emanations or lesser gods. But Paul said, no way, Jesus is not one of the lesser gods of the fullness. He is the fullness. And so... This word is so key in Paul turning that false teaching back to the truth by using plorema, which means the full measure, the completeness, the, the totality of God. God is fully present in the person of Christ. As it says in Colossians 2.9, in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So there's no part of Jesus that is not God, and Jesus is completely, totally, and perfectly a display of the attributes of God. So, the fullness of God dwells in him, and it says here that actually it was pleased to dwell, which means God delighted in tabernacling among us, identifying with us, becoming one of us, and so First, we see the fullness of God in Christ, and now we see God is dwelling among us as a human. So there's no part of God Jesus is not, but there's no part of man that Jesus is not. He's fully God and fully man. So let that blow your mind for a while. Not just a cold theological truth, but for God, it was an enjoyable, delightful experience to walk among us 
to tabernacle among us. And it kind of reminds me of when my kids were young. We had fun setting up tents in the backyard and we would, um, you know, hang out there all day and they'd be just excited about the fun of dad's tent being set up next to their tents. And, and we would spend the night outside until they got scared or cold and we would go inside, of course. I don't know if we ever made it through a full night, but it was delightful to enter into their world and it was delightful for them to have dad in their world. And so salvation is God's joyous work. He delighted to be tabernacled among us. In John 1.14, it speaks of this dwelling among us. It says, And the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He joyfully fills our life and he fellowships with us. And so not only does he live among us, but he lives within us. God was truly, fully with us in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we call him Emmanuel, God with us. And so as he is with us and in us, he's sufficient for everything in our life. We can lean on him for anything that we're going through because of who he is. And he delights in that. One night, while conducting an evangelistic meeting in the Salvation Army building in Chicago, Booth Tucker preached on the sympathy of Jesus. After his message, a man approached him and said, if your wife had just died like mine has, and your babies were crying for their mother, who would never come back, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying right now. Well, tragically, a few days later, Tucker's wife was killed in a train wreck. Her body was brought to Chicago and carried to the same building for the funeral. And after the service, the bereaved preacher looked down into the silent face of his wife and then turned to those attending. And he said this, The other day, a man told me I wouldn't speak of the sympathy of Jesus if my wife had just died. If that man is here, I want to tell him that Christ is sufficient. My heart is broken, but it has a song put there by Jesus. I want that man to know that Jesus Christ speaks comfort to me today. When God dwells among us, he's there and identifies with us through everything. When he became part of his creation, he experienced even the death of his own father. He experienced sorrow and the comfort that comes from the father, which he now shares with us when we suffer. So when we talk about Christ becoming one of us and being fully God, we know that there is a God who can relate with what we're going through. In verse 20, it continues, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. There's a Spanish story of a father and a son who had become estranged. The son ran away and the father set off to find him. And he searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last desperate effort to find his son, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the new, this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday at noon, the father showed up and found 800 Pacos looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers all of them hoping that that was their dad. God is a loving father who sent his son to reconcile with us. And so here Paul reminds us that it's through him, it's through Christ that reconciliation is achieved. When the first man and woman sinned, they became like sheep going astray, going their own way. And Isaiah 53, six, it tells us this about all of mankind. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Essentially, mankind declared war on God, but instead of God declaring war on man, he seeks us out to reconcile with us. This word reconcile means to reunite, to reestablish a relationship after it's been broken, or to bring back to a former state of harmony. Essentially, it means to change from an enemy to a friend. God wanted to bring reconciliation, not just a compromise. And so he died in our place and brings us into a relationship with him and adopts us as his children. Reconciliation with God is something that's actually accomplished for us. It's not something we accomplish. He initiated it. He sought us out. He paid the price and he will bring that reconciliation and eternal relationship to completion. All we do is receive it. We just show up like those Pacos whose father called on his name to come and be reconciled. Are you ready to come home to the father? Maybe you're already there, but sometimes you forget from where you came. The depravity that you were in when God found you. So we do have a heavenly father that longs for reconciliation. Are you experiencing that right now? You know, a lot of people are concerned about getting to heaven. Uh, But why? Uh, To live forever in a state of pleasure or to avoid hell? Have you ever thought about that before? Why do people want to go to heaven? Well, the reason God wants us in heaven is to have an eternal relationship with him. And that can begin right now. When it speaks of God reconciling all things, it also speaks not only of our lives, but also earth and heaven. The work of reconciliation covers the widest imaginable scale. It doesn't speak of a universal salvation, but setting all things right. And so Jesus ultimately brings harmony to the universe, whether it be willingly or unwillingly, he will bring harmony. Every enemy and rebellious angelic being will be put under his feet in subjection. Some irreconcilable beings have to be cast into the lake of fire, which actually was originally prepared for the devil and his angels. But those who rebel and do not want that relationship with God who came to reconcile with them will also experience that second death. Everything, whether good or bad, will be used to glorify Christ in the end. Every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. Everything will be restored to that divine harmony that was meant to be there from the beginning. And that's so important to remember, again, in this chaotic time that we're living in. Be encouraged by that. Jesus, it says here, made peace by the blood of his cross. Now, this is speaking of a relational peace. Where we have turned away, we have all become enemies of God, and people try all sorts of things to fix that on their own to get to heaven, whether it be good works or through religious um, practices or going to church or whatever it may be. But the only payment for sin that is going to get us to heaven is the shedding of Christ's blood, which means that a life had to be sacrificed. When we speak of the shedding of blood, that a life had to be sacrificed. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so why does the Bible talk so much about blood? Is because that is the only solution to sin, is a substitute, somebody to give their life. Scripture tells us that since the wages of sin is death, there has to be 
a payment. The cross was an instrument of execution. And to the Jew, it was a sign of being accursed by God. In Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so the cross and the blood of Christ becomes the center of life for the believer. The famous Muir Woods in California are named for John Muir, father of the national parks, famous explorer and naturalist. In his books, uh, the book that he writes, Travels in Alaska, Muir tells an amazing story of the Tinglet and Sitka Indians, two tribes that readily accepted the preaching of the gospel in Alaska in 1879. He writes this story. The Tlingit tribes give a hearty welcome to Christian missionaries. In particular, they are quick to accept the doctrine of the atonement, which means to pay the price for or to cover with blood, because they themselves practiced it. Although To many of the civilized whites, it is a stumbling block, a rock of offense. As an example of their own doctrine of atonement, they told Mr. Young and me, that's John Muir, one evening that 20 or 30 years ago, there was a bitter war between the Tlingit and the Sitka tribes. Great fighters and pretty evenly matched. After fighting all summer, in a squabbling way, fighting now undercover, now in the open, watching for every chance for a shot. None of the women dared venture out to the salmon streams or berry fields to procure the winter stock of food. At this crisis, one of the Stikeen chiefs came out of his block house fort into an open space midway between their fortified camps and shouted that he wished to speak to the leader of the Sitkas. When the Sitka chief appeared, he said to him, my people are hungry. They dare not go out to the salmon streams or berry fields for winter supplies. And if this war goes on much longer, most of my people will die of hunger. We have fought long enough. Let us make peace. You brave Sitka warriors go home, and we go home, and we will all set out to dry salmon and berries before it's too late. The Sitka chief replied, you may well say let us stop fighting when you have had the best of it. You have killed ten more of my tribe than we have killed of yours. Give us ten stikeen men to balance our blood account. Then, and not till then, will we make peace and go home. Very well, replied the Stikeen chief. You know my rank. You know that I am worth 10 common men and more. Take me and make peace. His noble offer was promptly accepted. The Stikeen chief stepped forward and was shot down inside of the fighting bands. Peace was thus established, and all made haste to their homes and ordinary work. That chief literally gave himself as a sacrifice for his people. He died that they might live. Therefore, when missionaries preached the doctrine of the atonement, Christ shedding his blood, explaining that when all mankind had gone astray, had broken God's law and deserved to die, God's son came forward and, like this keen chief, offered himself as a sacrifice to heal the cause of God's wrath and set all the people of the world free, the doctrine was readily accepted. And they said this, Yes, your words are good. The Son of God, the Chief of Chiefs, the Maker of all the world, must be worth more than all mankind put together. Therefore, when his blood was shed, the salvation of the world was made sure. And so as we're looking at the fullness of the deity being in bodily form, the fullness of God dwelling in Christ. When he was sacrificed for mankind, he was the ultimate sacrifice. 
He paid the ultimate price for your sin. In Psalm 49, it speaks of this whole idea. In verse 7, it says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. The ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and not see the pit. But there was one whose ransom was enough, and that was the sinless, perfect Son of God become man, shedding his blood on the cross. And so last week, we talked about being in awe of creation and having that give us a view of God's transcendence and imminence. If this creation puts you in awe as you look at the stars and your mind does flips and things, you know, trying to understand it all, just wait. There's a new creation coming. If this creation is orderly and beautiful, detailed down to the quantum level, just wait. There's a new creation coming. If this creation seems glorious, just wait. You haven't seen anything yet. The awe of the new creation will blow you away. In Hebrews 12, verse 18, we see this contrast between the old creation and the new. The old covenant and the new covenant. And it says this, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom, and a tempest at the sounds of trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. And it's speaking of the law being delivered at Mount Sinai. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So in contrast to that, it says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now, as he has promised yet once more, and I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, creation, that is things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken, the new creation, may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And so, what we find in the new creation is a greater awe, a greater reverence, for who God is, not lesser compared to the Old Testament. And so as we may be discouraged in this day, let's think of the greater kingdom that is coming, of the greater covenant, of the new creation. As we apply this to our lives, there's three things that I'd encourage you with. You know, after talking about all this theological stuff and, and whatnot, it's always a challenge to bring it down to practical life. And so, applying this to our lives. First, remember Jesus made you a new creation. When he was first born among the dead and the firstborn in the new creation, he made you a new creation. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The person you used to be is no longer who you are. You are a new creation in Christ. You have a new identity and a new future. Christ didn't come to make bad men better, to uh, give us some sort of self-help theology, but rather to make dead men alive. He came to make you a new creation. So 
let the old things in your life pass away. The way you used to think, the way that you used to live. It's time to put those things aside and walk in the newness of life. But secondly, respect the preeminence of Jesus in everything. The purpose of this passage is to show that Christ is supreme, that he is preeminent, and he will subject everything to himself, even this messed up world. And so, as he's head of the church, as we understand that we live in a Christ-centric universe, have you fully surrendered your life to him? A woman once asked her pastor, will you please tell me in a word what your idea of consecration is, which means to be set apart, holy, um, for God's purpose. And so holding out a blank sheet of paper, the pastor replied, it's to sign your name at the bottom of this blank sheet of paper and then to let God fill it in as he will. So if we respect the preeminence of Jesus in our life, that means we surrender to him as Lord and live as he shows us how. And so, remember, Jesus made you a new creation. Secondly, respect the preeminence of Jesus in everything. And then lastly, resolve to live valiantly for Jesus in a world not yet redeemed. As we wait for our redemption and the redemption of the universe, as we looked at the, this messed up world, it's not the way it's supposed to be with its decay and chaos and sin, especially in these end times, we need boldness in this world that is passing away as we are new creations and we belong to another kingdom. Don't live like the citizens of this world. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it talks about those citizens of the world who will not be allowed into God's kingdom. And it says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I find it interesting that it begins the list with cowardly. Why would it do that? Well, if you read the book of Revelation, the cowardly give in and Take the mark of the beast for fear of their own lives. Our enemy won't give up without a fight. And one of his great tools is fear, discouragement. One of the ways he does that is by dividing and conquering. And in this time, I don't know about you, but I do feel separated from the rest of the flock at times. And so we need to find ways to stay connected, stay encouraged, to also be brave in these days in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Take encouragement from Psalm 60 verse 12 where it says, With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. And so stick close to him no matter what is going on. Don't give in to cowardice. Be prepared to endure till the end, to stand your ground together as we await for the redemption of all things. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for being preeminent, for being firstborn among the dead, for paving the way for salvation and even delighting in becoming one of us and identifying with us. Lord, it's so amazing, all these great theological truths, but I pray that you would help us to go from our minds delighting in them to our hearts delighting in them in faith, that in these days we would be encouraged by this hope, that you would help us to go from being discouraged and downtrodden to being victorious and confident in you. And if there's anybody that needs to accept salvation today, that they would pray in their hearts, Jesus, thank you for dying in my place, for shedding your blood on my behalf. I turn to you and away from my own sin, and I call out your name, Jesus Christ, save me. Help me to follow you all my days. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to give, you can donate online using the church app or at calvarygateharbor.com. Have a great week. See you next time. Oh,